So I'm an activist and I turned into a scholar. I did my PhD at, um, or I'm doing my PhD at Leeds University. But while doing research, I stayed an activist and I, um, I lead the Leave it in the Ground initiative. And these are just some uh, visuals to give you um, some ideas of where, uh, what we're working on in Lingo. Now, um, I'm doing that work in the context of the climate emergency. And as you know, we don't have much time to decarbonize and stop fossil fuels. So my question was, what are the biggest chunks that we need to stop? And those are the carbon bombs. And since we don't have much time, let's just jump right in. The definition of a carbon bomb is a fossil fuel project that can emit over a gigaton of CO2 over its lifetime. And that is counting only the fossil fuel to be burned. And a gigaton, you probably have a notion, but if you don't, that's about twice the UK emissions, annual emissions of the whole country in one single coal mine or one single oil and gas field. Those are called projects in our research. So we just try to figure out where are those projects, how many of them are there and the map probably does not look very surprising for most of you uh, with a big accumulation in China, uh, quite a number in the Middle East, in the US, you can see a big dot also in Russia, and in some other countries, about 50 countries in the world have carbon bombs. Um, we, so these are about out of these 425 projects, about half are oil and gas fields, half are coal mines. And we try to see if this is a significant part of the fossil fuel picture in terms of current extraction. And uh, uh, from these projects, we get about half of oil and gas and a quarter of the coal that's being burned uh, annually. So it does capture a good uh, portion of the picture. We compared it to a, a 1.5 degree carbon budget and just in these 425 projects, we have more than double the CO2 that could be emitted under a, a 1.5 budget. And one of the interesting things we found was that 40% of those projects are new projects that hadn't started yet in 2020. So that means there is something to be done about it. And that's what um, I'll talk about next, some strategic options for where to go with these uh, projects. Um, the first one, and um, I can see Christoph in the room <laughs> um, who talked about it this morning, is to say, let's not build any new projects. Um, that is, of course, a very important, would be a very important contribution of getting that carbon bombs picture more in line with the climate picture and the Paris targets. A second thing is to use what we called harvest mode. And I learned that from some oil industry folks who said we're now putting everything in harvest mode. And that means you don't invest new capital. You just keep the infrastructure that you have, keep it going, but uh, you don't build anything new. And that seems like an interesting uh, offer also for the investment community that has money at stake in fossil fuels. Um, but, you know, if you're not placing new bets, you're not placing, uh, um, um, spending more capital, then uh, you might be much more sure that um, you're not um, uh, suffering at the end of the day financially uh, in that sector. So harvest mode is an interesting thing. And we did a little analysis of how that would change the picture and it makes it much more compatible with 1.5. And then the third piece uh, is early closure. Um, that that has been uh, in recent analyses as well, the need to close things early. And especially for coal, I think it's now quite uh, obvious. Uh, if you look at the economics of coal versus new uh, renewables plus storage that uh, closing down coal early before uh, extracting all that coal um, will be one of the things we'll surely be doing uh, in the next uh, in the next years. So that's on a more theoretical level, but on a practical level, as an activist, um, we take, you know, we take what we can get in terms of pushing back against fossil fuels. And there the picture looks a little bit different. And um, the options um, are 
first, of course, you have to identify where the biggest pieces are. And that's what we did. I encourage you to have a look at the carbon bombs list and see if there are um, any surprises or things that you think uh, you could be working on or making a difference. Then next, you need to understand um, how these things operate and where the weak spots are. And here is a piece of good news. These are so huge projects that they take many years to prepare. And that's what Christoph showed this morning as well. And then they take decades to operate and they take a long time to even get to the point of break even where uh, you recover the capital. But that doesn't mean you have actually um, made any money from it. So um, basically any carbon bomb, any new carbon bomb today is a decade long bet on keeping this uh, dysfunctional situation where we're burning down the house collectively, uh, operating just like that um, over the next decades. And that's really a risky bet. Um, in terms of understanding, I think uh, the state owned enterprises are a really, really big part of the picture. If you look at the list, you will see that much of that is controlled by those. So in these um, hot spots that the Western climate movement is not looking at, we really need strategies. So that is also a need coming out of that analysis. And, um, you know, because they are so huge, they are connected with many different actors in society, the machinery uh, suppliers, the finance, the insurance, and then downstream who's processing it, who's turning it into products and buying it and selling it. So there's many, many different people involved. And that also means there are many points we can attack with campaigning. And uh, to just take one out, the, the, the financing is quite interesting. We uh, did an uh, an analysis together with colleagues from Urgewalt on who is financing the about 40 Russian carbon bombs. And we found that there are more than 400 foreign institutions providing financial support for these uh, Russian carbon bombs. And there were over $130 billion of uh, foreign support in these. So then to defuse them, there's litigation. There was a panel uh, just now on that. There is civil disobedience. We, well, I know that some of us in the room have been um, on that, um, active on that. And there's also reframing and I'll um, keep that relatively short. Um, it's about talking about the social cost of carbon, the climate death and climate damages that are associated. And if it's such huge projects, it's really, really uh, huge numbers that we're talking about. The mortality cost of carbon that has been quantified uh, means that every single project would kill more people on that list, would kill more people than the war in Ukraine. And that's uh, quite something. And then about fossil gas, because it washes out so quickly from the atmosphere, it's a good candidate for responding to the climate emergency through a quick phase out. And I think that is a reframing uh, that we should be doing to counter the narrative of the fossil gas industry that methane is the greatest thing for the, the climate emergency. Uh, because it helps you transition. That's really a, a, a narrative I, I'd like to to question. And then another option for going towards diffusing, and that is one we are not yet seeing, is governments talking between themselves about fossil fuels and climate and shutting it down. I mean, this conference has grown a lot. That's a good sign. And we need to get to the next steps where governments are talking about who is going to keep it in the ground, who's going to take it out. Um, that's pending, but we have seen traction on the fossil treaty and other initiatives. So I'm hopeful that we'll sooner or later get to that stage. Thank you very much. Okay, hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna talk about our ongoing work uh, about uh, non-energy use of oil, long-term scenarios for the petrochemical industry and the global energy and materials transition. So this is our full research team, two of them, three of them, counting me are here. And uh, just to give a brief overview with some numbers of the global petrochemical industry, we're talking about here of the non-energy use of oil, of non-combustion uses. So uh, when you talk about that, when we talk about scenarios for the chemical industry, we have to consider the kind of energy use uh, and the CO2 emissions that are that, that this industry is responsible for. So around 60% of all the oil consumed here 
It's not for combustion uses, but as, as raw material, as, as feedstock for fertilizers, uh, plastics, fibers, and so on. Second aspect that I want to point out is the applications of this use, the, the plastic use, which is like roughly 40% is used for packaging, um, which has a very low, very short time uh, uh, of use. So within a year, you, 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 you have it disposed with leads me to the third point, with, which is plastic waste mismanagement. So most of the countries, most of the regions don't have like a well uh, destiny for this plastics. So we have them going to, into um, marine environments and so on. So just to focus here, we have fossil fuels tra being transformed to basic chemicals and then to final products. But here I'm going to focus mostly on light olefins, which are ethylene, propylene, and butadine, and aromatics. And so I'm not focusing on agrochemicals, speci specialty chemicals, but mostly plastics, fibers, and uh, rubbers. So the main research question here is what is the role of oil in the chemical sector uh, in climate change scenarios, considering different final disposal and demand scenarios regionally. So just a brief presentation of the model that we, we used. Alexandre presented it today earlier. The coffee model is a global integrated assessment model, which is um, IMP for in the IPCC AR6, an illustrative mitigation uh, pathway. It's based on a message pl platform. Uh, it's a global IAM with 18 regions based on perfect foresight and linear programming optimization. And it's good to mention that it's completely hard linked the energy and land use systems. So it's an important tool to analyze uh, synergies and trade-offs in oil, uh, in energy, environmental, and climate policy. So we're looking here at the, I'm not gonna go through that that much, but we're looking at this part of the industry sector, the petrochemicals, and just a brief overview. I don't wanna get too much in detail here, but we have different, demands for each one of these basic chemicals, ethylene, propylene, butadiene, and aromatics. And I just want to stress the structure of this industry, which is that we have um, propylene and aromatics, we have uh, all the things, we have ba basic chemicals being co-produced in oil refineries. So when the, we shut down these refineries, where does this demand, uh, how we will supply this demand? So we have refinery co-production, we have multi product routes, which are distinct cracking, the basic, like the heart of the chemical industry, which produces, like has a balanced basket of all of these olefins. And we have on purpose routes based on different, different platforms. We have the technology rich uh, module. Uh, and we have also ammonia and methanol that I'm not gonna uh, focus here, but just to stress, we have bio-based alternatives, fossil based, and we have CCU based through the methanol uh, route here. So this is the supply supply side uh, module. And when we, considering the, the the scenarios that we ran, we're focusing on a baseline business as usual scenario. We have a demand scenario reduction, um, a demand reduction scenario. We have a circular economy with more mechanical recycling scenario. We have a climate ambitious scenario with a carbon budget. And we have all of these trends, all of these strategies combined. And we here we want to see also how the, the, the reduction of demand in packaging in 90% of plastic use for packaging by 2030, how does that impact the uh, potential for recycling? Because we will have less inflow of waste coming into the system and how does that affect the circular kind of measures that, it, that are being put into place. So basically, just going through the scenarios again, this is our, this is our scenario for demand. Uh, this is the baseline, and this is the final disposal scenario. Incineration, landfilling, recycling for each one of these regions. And we consider that just as a modeling exercise, we, we, we assume that these trends continue until 2060, which is the, the time frame that you're using here. And the demand reduction scenario, we assume that 90% of the packaging use uh, are reduced, just as a starting analysis, but we don't assume any change in the final disposal scenario. Climate ambition, same thing, but 
we assume a raising carbon price that is based on a, a that is compatible with a 1.5 degree world um, and the increased circularity scenarios all of the other variables are uh, baseline we don't assume any changes but we assume a higher uh, a higher rate of recycling considering a dynamic stock flow modeling uh, of uh, demands and, and, and waste of uh, inflows. And when we have all of these scenarios combined, we see that the, the potentials for recycling decrease. So when we have the reduction of packaging demand and we have the increase of uh, recycling, we see that the potentials reduce. And we have also a carbon price in place. So just uh, some brief results that we just, um, we just got. This is the primary HVC production and CO2 emissions for each one of the scenarios that we ran. So what we see here is that the production of the primary production in the demand reduction scenario in the period of 2025 and 2045 uh, reduces, so compared to, to, the, to the levels of circular economy. But by the end of 2060, 2055, we see that they achieve like very similar um, uh, figures. But when we couple all these strategies, this is the this is where we can get like very low um, or lower uh, figures of uh, HVC production. And when we see the impact on, of this in um, CO2 emissions, we see that the recycling kind of surpasses the baseline scenario uh, by 2055 because of the recycling emissions and also that well, the climate ambition scenario, it reaches net, net zero, but it's much easier to reach lower uh, emissions figures when we have uh, circular economy measures and demand reduction measures in place. And these are the impact. This is not only for HVCs. This is the whole energy use in the chemical industry. But as we see, the, the, the HVC has a huge impact. And this is final energy. And here we have the use of energy for as feedstock. So what we see here is that when we couple all of these strategies, we see there's a reduced demand for final energy compared to the other scenarios. And, uh, and we reduce also the need for biomass comparing to the climate ambitious scenario, which is here. And also feedstock, we have um, a lot of, a lot we use a lot of gas. The scenario sees a lot of gas entering the the system. It re, it prefers gas than naphtha, and uh, we see also a potential use of biomass uh, for as feedstock. And also, so here what we see is that there's there's surplus of ethanol when we electrify the 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 fleet. So it's used for the petrochemical sector, and there's also some synergies between. Um, aviation fuels and uh, navigation shipping fuels, which are also hard to abate setters. So we also in these platforms we co-produce petrochemical uh, naphtha, bio naphtha. So, and here we have the the type of feedstock, uh, the, the the amount of HVC produced per feedstock. We see that CCU is not. Um, it doesn't, it, it's not a, a least cost solution for the model. So we see biomass entering, and but less biomass is needed when we have demand reduction and when we have circular economy measures. And this is the technology profile of the different scenarios. And what we see is that um, we use a lot of, of on-purpose route in climate ambition scenarios, but steam cracking remains predominant in all scenarios. But what we see here is that it decreases and also the use of oil decreases over time only when we have both of these strategies combined, uh, circular economy and uh, demand reduction. So the scenarios, and this is just a, a modeling exercise, um, oil remains an important feedstock for HVC production, alternatives. Um, bio-based alternatives are preferred over CCU, which is also like uh, important to achieve uh, climate goals. And both demand, de demand reduction and recycling are uh, important to reduce both plastic waste and emissions in the sector. 
and also just finalize we did an assess chemical recycling or crude oil to chemicals but these could be game changers to the industry if they were successfully implemented or well but well that's it thank you um yeah happy to have any questions so hello everyone, thank you for, for having me. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so indeed, the, my presentation is gonna focus on the, um, the research we've done for an upcoming report that looks at various different energy scenarios and look at what do they, what do they tell us about 1.5 degree compatible energy future. So we look at a bunch of integrated assessment model because basically the, the influence expectation for energy producer, energy consumer, investor, and also sort of the, the policy maker, assessment of the future outlook of the energy system. So that significantly contributes to um, steer energy producers' investment decision and financial actors' assessment in the trend in the energy market. So, um, so it's important to understand what IEM tell us and how these different mix of policy decision affects the achievability of different climate goal and how also the, the current energy crisis might affect the outcome for how do we go through the energy transition. So since the um, IPCC 6 assessment report uh, working group 3 database came out, we've been digging into the, um, all of the IAM that were published in there. And so we looked at specifically the about 100 scenario that limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius with no or low overshoot, and then filter them for the, the amount of carbon CCS, well, fossil uh, CCS and bioenergy carbon capture and storage that they had. <laughs> based on the IPCC feasibility assessment for this technology. So we limited the sequestration to about three gigaton per year by 2050 and about three gigaton also for BECS by 2050 and look at sort of these so-called feasible 1.5 degree pathway with these, um, with these uh, fossil CCS and, um, and CDR. And then we did the same thing for afforestation and reforestation. So there are threats to overwhelmingly using these um, these uh, these carbon sequestration method for land use um, water use also like territorial disputes so um, the maximum sustainable potential also needs to be sort of um, managed to um, some level that limit these these risks um, so then afterwards we look at specifically with this set of about 26 pathway from this 100 um, IPCC scenario that limits warming to 1.5. So what were the specific oil and gas um, phase out pathway? And as you all know, and as Christopher explained um, this morning, um, the IA uh, last year for the first time published a net zero emission scenario that limit warming to 1.5. And this is the uh, level of oil and gas reduction in this scenario. And its conclusion was that there should be no room for new oil and gas development. Um, and so we find that with the IPCC scenario that we've taken out of the uh, latest assessment report, that we find that the same conclusion apply with this uh, assessment. But they don't make the same policy recommendation because it's outside of the mandate to make policy prescriptive um, recommendations. <coughs> and so we find that conclusion because Basically, um, this is the embodied emission from the fields that are currently developing or uh, already producing. So the embodied carbon emission you see here is already enough to um, consume the entire carbon budget for that sector in, in the economy. And uh, this is how much more uh, carbon emission could be released in the atmosphere if, if new fields would be developed. And these are all li license reserves um that that could be uh that could be developed over the forthcoming years and uh in terms of the license reserve and the new exploration that could be deployed and see that by 2050 would go to about twice twice as much of the emission that would be consistent with 1.5 degree pathways so again emphasizing the fact that there's no room for new oil and gas development under both of these scenarios and um and to find sort of the robustness of this analysis and um find what are the, the other sort of conclusion from other scenario, another modeling group, then we also looked at what Bloomberg New Energy Finance 1.5 degree pathway looked at, what IRENA, um, we also look at uh, British Petroleum scenario, but also other IPCC illustrative mitigation pathway. And uh, we find that uh, the results are roughly consistent with uh, the IEA and IPCC 1.5 degree pathway for oil and gas. Mm. And actually we find that uh, even in the illustrative mitigation pathway from the IPCC, so that's the green line at the bottom, 
um, when if you use much less uh, CCS and CDR, then we should actually decarbonize much faster the oil and gas sector. And if we use actually zero uh, CCS and CDR, just as the OECM model, which is the one that was uh, commissioned by the UNEP uh, principal for responsible investor, which has about 99% reduction of oil and gas by 2050, that uh, the curve is, is much steeper. And uh, the few ones that are above the IPCC and IEA scenarios, um, actually the one from BP, which is above, uh, which is the top one, which actually has fossil CCS um, sequestration that is above the IPCC feasibility threshold for that, that technology. And um, similarly for the IPCC um, uh, REN scenario, which actually has coal reducing extremely fast, and that's why it leaves a bit more room for oil and gas in that scenario. But actually, if you have a bit more coal in the, the system, then oil and gas should reduce faster. Um, and then in the um, in light of the current um, energy crisis, I think it's important to also look at what specifically Europe gas consumption should look like under 1.5 degree scenarios and um, and whether we should be developing new field to uh, or not to comply with this uh, with the supply crunch at the moment. So this is the the current pr production and consumption of um, of gas from existing field within Europe. And then here we see the import from the Middle East and Africa region and from the Asperger existing fields that are imported for uh, gas consumption in Europe, which is about 300 um, billion cubic barrel per, uh, per year. And then with um, the LNG utilization at 80% from all of the other import uh, LNG infrastructure at the moment, then reach about 500 uh, billion cubic meter per year of consumption. And this is the, the Russian supply that they're being phased out at the moment. And uh, so we find that actually with our subset of 1.5 degree uh, pathway from the IPCC, so the one that we filtered out for feasibility and, um, and uh, maximum sustainable potential for CDR and CCS, that the um, gas consumption for Europe alone is actually within the range of the uh, current import capacity of, uh, of gas in Europe. So meaning that um, we should not be developing any new import infrastructure and that if we were to comply with the 1.5 degree target, then we should be able to maintain um, a gas consumption with the existing infrastructure. And actually even the Europe consumption under the Repower EU plan is also very much aligned with the 1.5 degree pathway. So also indicating that there is sort of a short term supply crunch in 2022 and 2023, but um, developing new infrastructure would lock ourselves in into uh, several decades of uh, new import and uh, that would be a real challenge afterwards to decommission and create stranded assets um, over the forthcoming decades. And uh, so that sort of emphasized the need to significantly accelerate the investment in uh, wind and solar technology, which have the most mitigation potential, also at the lowest cost. And from our analysis of the IPCC scenarios, um, we need about 800 billion per year in wind and solar alone uh, by 2030 in annual investment uh, to, to, uh, to be consistent with 1.5 degree uh, limiting of temperature rise. However, we find that there's only about half of that that's forecasted to be invested, leaving an investment gap of about 450 billion by 2030. And then the good news, if I may say, is that actually the investment in new fields and uh, development and exploration, uh, so the capex and opex in um, oil and gas exploration and in new field, is actually about 570 billion only by 2030 alone. And this would be enough by itself to plug the investment gap in 2030. So actually, it's not that there's a lack of money, it's just that it's all being invested in the wrong places and uh, emphasizing the need to remobilize pr private capital flows from fossil fuel industry towards um, a renewable energy sector. And uh, just to conclude, um, I sort of here where the key messages of this presentation is that developing new oil and gas field is incompatible with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this is um, a conclusion that we find not only from the IA scenario, but also uh, endorsed by the IPCC and a broader set of scenarios. So we show that it's actually a robust finding across the wealth of like authoritative or well-cited um, models across the, um, the, the industry. And, and actually the IPCC scenario that we've looked at, which limits 
the um, carbon sequestration to feasible and sustainable level, so actually by 2030, we should reduce oil and gas production by 30% already, and by about 65% by 2050, which is also what all of the other models show, that by 2050, about 65% is the, the minimum that we, we find. And um, also that there's no room for new fossil fuel import infrastructure in Europe in the 1.5 degree aligned phase out pathways. And apart from the short term supply crunch in 2022, 2023, then do have the capacity to uh, transition the energy sector in order to um, not to develop any new uh, infrastructure. And then, as I just shown, that the, um, the investment gap uh, for wind and solar is, is huge, but can be plugged by remobilizing capital flows um, from the fossil fuel industry towards uh, the renewable energy sector. So thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great, to, great to be here again. I was here just before lunch, so uh, sorry you had to put up with me twice. Anyway, um, what I was going to talk about was... Um, a global study that we did um, and it's basically its use in the UK conversation or the UK debate that's been happening around oil and gas um, production going forward. It's been quite a sort of strong debate at different times, particularly preceding COP. But I just want to reflect a little bit on on this global study and, 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 and how we've basically used it to inform what's going on in the UK. So as I said, yeah, much debate uh, in the UK, particularly around um, preceding COP26, around new oil and gas licensing. There was all this stuff about the Cumbrian coal mine, uh, Cambo, and so forth, and and um, whether we needed new new licensing, uh, what this looked like in terms of um, production phase out. And there's some very useful. Um, examples of global analysis that have really sort of informed the debate and, and Christoph spoke to that this morning but there's also been the production gap report um, and there's been a bunch of international initiatives um, the non uh, I can never say it the non-fossil fuel proliferation treaty um, BOGA and so forth which have all provided some momentum here um, so I want to speak a little bit about as I say a global study that that my colleague Dan Wellsby led um, which James Price was on, and he's in the audience, and Paul, of course, was a co-author on, um, and just talk a little bit about the UK context in respect of that paper. So our paper is feeding into the debate. Um, this is, I hope there's no one from UK government here, but this is our paper stuck against the Ministry of Energy um, in the UK. Um, I think this is much better than citations and downloads. I think... <laughs> This is this is where it's at, um, getting your paper sort of put up in, in public places. I think it went on the shell building as well, which was great. Um, so, of course, it's feeding in um, to the debate more generally. But, of course, we want it to feed in in a more nuanced way, we could say, through consultations, through um, public inquiries, that sort of thing. So we're really interested in what the paper says in terms of the UK uh, context um, in particular. So um, just to give you some UK context, I know a lot of you are sort of experts in this anyway, um, but the UK is still the second largest European producer, but it's been in decline uh, for some time. The black bar, um, the black shaded area here for gas um, shows the sort of um, increase in production that's about 2000 and then the decline um, and the pink wedge coming in and filling in the the imports making us more sort of import dependent um, the lower chart shows the show shows what's going on in terms of in terms of oil so you see this sort of peak in 2000 then the decline to sort of 2012 2013 and then something of a of a stabilization uh, much of the gas as you can see this is the um the export piece here. You can see much of the gas that we produce is used in the UK, um, whereas a lot of the oil is shipped out to refining capacity um, across Europe. Um, and the, and there's the sort of current context, I mean, what's happening to the sector? The UK government, as we all know, we've got a new administration, which we're, we're all really pleased about. Um, <laughs> um, but the priority remains maximizing recovery from, from the um, oil and gas um, basin. Um, and this has been reinforced in recent weeks. Um, 
and and of, obviously we're now looking at new licensing grounds the the, the sort of re-emergence of the fracking debate and so forth there was some attempt to look at um moving transitioning the transitioning the sector um, through the North Sea transition deal, but this is a sort of fairly weak voluntary package that really doesn't do a lot in terms of really sort of changing the course in terms of production in the UK. And then there was a lot of excitement about this announced climate compatibility checkpoint, which was to a bunch of tests that we're going to sort of look and see which of the oil and gas um, projects that came online in the UK were climate compatible. Um, and there's a lot of interest because actually some of the tests were around scope three emissions, were around sort of the production gap and so forth. Um, it's just been released last week and it's a very, very weak um, document that really only focuses on um, upstream emissions and is very much advisory. But anyway, just to say this got us into the ideas uh, motivated by NGOs such as Uplift around what, what could our paper say about um, any of this. So just to say something about the sort of general insights from Wellesby et al. 2021. Um, so basically this paper said, and it was sort of McGlade Eakins Mark II, but it said for a 1.5 degrees limit, almost 60% of oil and gas and 90% of coal reserves must remain unextracted. But then it did something additionally interesting and, and um, Olivier has talked about this, but what was the decline rate in terms of uh, these uh, these different um, uh, pro, uh, the, the oil and gas production? And we saw a three on average a three percent year on year global decline out to 2050, broadly aligning with the IEA net zero work, but a real strong variation in decline rates between regions. And that's the interesting thing from the UK perspective, which I'll come on to. Um, but then um, uh, the other thing we really wanted to um, sort of contextualize this study around was that we actually think this is an underestimate that if we account for CDR risks, and the low probability budget that we used, 50%, um, that actually a more rapid transition would be needed. And that, that sort of language was quite important, I think, in explaining the study. Okay, in terms of informing the national discussion, so some key points. Uh, the UK, UK decline needs to be more rapid than other regions. That was a key um, outcome with decline rates of between six to 7% per year, pointing to no new investment by new licensing. And what this suggested, if you were then to do the math in terms of looking at cumulative production um, out to uh, 2050, was that the cumulative production levels were not significantly higher than the reserves that were already under uh, development. Third point, I've already mentioned this, but the, these decline rates were something of what we consider to be an underestimate of what was actually needed for the reasons I've already mentioned. And the other interesting thing about the, 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 the sort of this global analysis was that we were looking at it from a carbon budget context. So if the UK produces above its decline rate or doesn't stick with its decline rate, a country somewhere else cannot uh, produce something. So we, we, we tried to reinforce the message that this is something of a balancing um, perspective based on a sort of a, a global budget approach. But what were some of the limitations to the insights? We're obviously using a global model here. There's a limit in terms of granular detail around the UK specifics. And that, that, that was something that we had to sort of think about when we were using the outputs of this. We don't have the, we don't have the detail in terms of import and export considerations around commodity flows. So how, how crude um, is exported and how refinery products are brought back in. So some of that sort of level of detail is missing. And then we don't have the information on the tax regimes, political economy considerations, which are so important uh, to the UK debate and the UK situation. So final slide. Um, we, you know, what we, what we also wanted to do as well as using this kind of global analysis was think about some of the other complementary evidence needed on UK production limits. Um, and trying to do that from a context specific 
point of view for the UK, but also trying to tap into what's politically salient, which is not always easy. Um, so the first point is uh, we emphasize the resilience to supply shocks. So another bit of our research was very much on focus on reducing demand. So it's, and that's where the UK conversation has gone. It's about safeguarding supply. We wanted to emphasize that actually demand reduction is, is critical. We also made a point of saying around this investment opportunity in clean technologies, which comes back to earlier presentations today, that um, there's a large, and, and for UK PLC, sort of um, in its new uh, free capacity to um, whatever, um, <laughs> There's a lot we you know, there's a large investment and trade opportunity for global. That's what I was looking for. Global Britain uh, with a strong potential for the oil and gas sector in terms of taking forward a uh, clean technology. Climate leadership, global influence. I'm not sure how important that is now, but around COP26, you know, this was a, a serious matter or, or so we thought in terms of contentious fossil fuel projects blemishing UK credentials. And then equity considerations. I don't know how salient this is, but clearly it's it's a really important part of this whole discussion, you know, about the UK's ability to shift, its low dependency, its historical benefits from oil and gas, um, and the historical emissions associated with production and use. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very much work in progress. Actually, my co-author, Ruth Egging, and I, we have started over and over with this paper because we find the results uh, a bit frustrating. And I think you'll see uh, what I mean and towards the end. Um, I don't think I have to define stranded assets uh, in this uh, um, audience here, uh, but uh, maybe let me point to uh, the fact that we are really talking about, um, yeah, uh, unexpected uh, policy shifts, uh, disruptive changes in market conditions, and I think we started the discussions on what that means for natu the natural gas sector uh, uh, nowadays. But here uh, in, in what we do with our modeling, um, we also look at the climate policy uh, side of, uh, of new policy, uh, of new scenarios essentially for, um, for the natural gas sector. We have a model that we call the global gas model that we've used for more than 10 years. And I want to show you the results for two different scenarios, um, uh, in particular the infrastructure results until 2050. Um, and what we can learn from that uh, for, uh, yeah, if you contrast capacity expansions between those scenarios for the natural gas inf transportation infrastructure. Um, the model is a detailed model with more than or almost 200 nodes uh, uh, globally, uh, a detailed value chain analysis, and it's run to 2060, and we present results to 2050. Um, it's, a, it's a partial equilibrium model, so really just gas only, uh, and um, it includes aspects like market power uh, in addition to, um, to really detailed but country, um, country links uh, uh, in terms of transportation infrastructure. So it's not pipeline by pipeline, but it, it's uh, links between uh, country nodes. We define two scenarios, um, and uh, that's maybe part of the work in progress still. Uh, we have one scenario, which we sort of think of as sort of, uh, a decarbonization scenario, which essentially has for natural gas a stable demand uh, outlook. And we started to discuss this already in the room, that this may not be the picture, but if you look actually at uh, a lot of the global scenarios that are out there, uh, they have decrease in coal, decrease in oil, but stable um, uh, demand for natural gas. Um, and we contrast, and this was from, um, I said, we've, take, we've done it over and over again, and this is still from the IEA World Energy Outlook 2017. So that was uh, the uh, essentially this, the sustainable development scenario, uh, demand data uh, in this decarbonization scenario, in the stable scenario, and in the growth, it was uh, what was called the new policy scenario back then. Uh, so sort of Paris agreement style uh, scenario, um, and that had global, uh, globally growing uh, natural gas demand. So that essentially is uh, this difference between the two scenarios. Um, and I plotted the 2020 model result line in there, and you see the growth in, uh, in the growth scenario about plus 55%, and the more or less stable development uh, in, the, um, in the stable scenario. 
If we look at the uh, uh, capacities, and this is here what is already in place uh, or was what was already uh, constructed by the time uh, of yeah, uh, 2020 when we did those results or when we started to uh, to do this modeling for 2020 data uh, so that's what we call exogenous capacities what's in place and decided and, and built uh, plus the expansions so those are the model results then um, and for the diff three different types of transportation infrastructure the pipelines the liquefaction of liquefied natural gas in the regasification, so the import side of liquefied natural gas, we find relatively little difference between the scenarios. And that's quite surprising if we see uh, almost 50% uh, more uh, demand uh, in the growth scenario uh, by, um, uh, by, by 2050 than in the stable scenario. But we have only a little bit more uh, liquefaction capacity in the growth scenario, but actually a little more regasification capacity in the stable demand scenario. And that's similar, actually, if you look at pipeline expansion, um, we have relatively similar um, cumulative expansion. So it's not, uh, uh, so those uh, almost 700 in 2050, it's cumulative from 2020 on to 2050, uh, but it's uh, almost 700 in both cases. So there's, it's at least comparing those two scenarios, uh, there, there's no generalized asset stranding risk um, uh, in, in either of the scenarios or in the uh, growth scenario compared to the stable scenario. Um, but it might well be that the global aggregation of numbers uh, sort of conceals asset-specific developments and regional factors. Which is why, since we have that 200-node model, uh, we decided to look at um, uh, what's going on, at least between the regions. It's still aggregated, or our results are aggregated here, uh, but it's a first step. And what we see is that most of the expansion is going on in Asia or to Asia. Um, it's really, this is where most of the demand growth is uh, in both in both scenarios, actually. And this is also where most of the action in terms of capacity expansion takes place, even though Asia is not really a pipeline market, but even uh, um, in pipelines, this is what draws most of the expansions. Um, if we look at some sort of uh, uh, country level data then, we see that much of the expansions is actually within countries. So it's really Russia, from Russia to Russia, it's from China, it's China um, to China, it's from India to India. So that's where most of the expansion takes place and that's not to, uh, not to uh, neglect. Um, and then we also have more sort of, uh, a bit more expansions between regions. And let me, uh, without going into the details here, um, sort of, uh, point to something that I will look at uh, on the following slides. Uh, we compared the expansion results for uh, one scenario, for each scenario actually, uh, that we get for 2030 with the numbers in the other scenario for 2030, but also for 2050. So the idea being uh, if in one scenario, uh, the same amount of uh, capacity of annual uh, import capacity is being built, then in the other scenario, well, then there is probably not a risk of stranding. Um, and uh, uh, then, we have this result in green, but if actually the numbers um, are lower, the capacity expansion is lower in the other scenario, then it's uh, flagged in, in yellow. We don't have the time to look at uh, all of them in detail, but the yellow ones are sort of the ones with a potential stranding risk. Um, uh, and doing that sort of um, link by link, uh, sort of, yeah, it shows two, two things. Uh, first, um, uh, it's it's not a lot of stranding risk, and so it's not really large um, um, like asset capacities at risk. Uh, and second, you always find sort of a reason why mm, maybe the model result is a little, a little bit of a deviation from reality. Take the first one here, um, Russia to China. That was without any um, boycott or sanction of Russian imports to uh, the EU. And we might well see that those uh, larger capacities from the stable scenario uh, to China will actually be used uh, even in a scenario of, um, uh, yeah, even in, in, a, in a, or in the current scenario with sanctions uh, to the EU, uh, for, yeah, to the EU. Similar in, um, uh, in the European Union, if you look at pipelines within the European Union, we have a lot of uh, green, uh, of yellow flags here. But first, you know, those are small capacities uh, that are at risk of being stranded, and second, they might, to a large extent, in, a, in this new situation that we have right now, uh, serve to alleviate, um, uh, yeah, a supply 
shortages uh, uh, now that we don't have Russian supplies anymore. In regasification, uh, similar, most uh, nodes that are small capacities that are at risk of being stranded. Uh, the only larger ones is uh, in China. Um, but this looks large to us uh, in Europe, but it's actually uh, modest if you compare that to the pipeline capacities and if you compare that to the growth uh, in uh, Chinese demand and import demand that we saw in the last 10 years. And in liquefaction, um, yeah, the, we have 10 BCM or so on the US side, uh, and uh, the largest one is actually in, in Mozambique. But that may be a case where um, China is just coming in, uh, in, uh, in and absorbing that. So I said China quite a lot, quite a lot now, and that's actually driving a large uh, um, uh, part of what's going on between the two scenarios. It's really the biggest market, or it's starting to be the biggest import market. So all of those international transport um, uh, capacities um, have a big uh, impact or have a big, um, uh, largely influenced by what's going on in China. Uh, interestingly, actually, uh, that might be a little confusing. The, the non-growth scenario, the stable scenario is the one with the higher uh, so the global stable scenario is the one with the higher demand growth in China, uh, essentially sort of absorbing what's not uh, used in other uh, in other countries, and that's probably compensating a lot of the stranding risks uh, uh, that you would expect in the stable scenario. Um, because in uh, yeah globally, and uh, the picture is very much driven by the EU side, where we have really the uh, the um, a decrease of demand in the stable scenario. Um, let me just move to this one. We did, uh, we've always done uh, in the last 10 years, uh, counterfactual scenarios of Russian sanctions or Russian boycott. Um, so we um, had some on, in the drawer and put them, pulled them out uh, this spring. Um, uh, so you have some of those uh, boycott results here, growth boycott and the stable boycott. Um, and what we see, so this is basically where there's no Russian supplies anymore on, on the left-hand side. Um, would we see that there is quite some compensation from U.S. Uh, LNG and also uh, African and North African in particular uh, pipeline and LNG supplies. So that uh, could also change, or would, will also change the picture, I should say, uh, in terms of capacity use. Um, and that's sort of blurring a lot of the picture and it's, there's no clear indication of uh, assets trending on the natural gas uh, transportation infrastructure. Um, uh, China plays a big role here. Uh, we also see that uh, liquefaction and regasification are quite flexible. Um, so um, we know that regasification investments are paying off at relatively low investment rates. So it's not actually decades that they need to pay off their investments. It's just a few years. Um, and that might even be true for other assets, in particular within, uh, if you have high price periods. Um, you have the, uh, developments like more and more floating units. On the regas side already for a while, but even on the liquefaction side nowadays. Um, and then, of course, you have all the discussion of repurposing pipelines and other as, uh, like um, LNG assets to um, hydrogen or other green gases. So uh, we also wondered if our, our scenarios are wrongly chosen. So we, um, we actually went to the scenarios that Olivier was pointing at, um, uh, but went to the primary source, went to the IPCC uh, scenarios as well, as well, and we're looking at um, looking at alternative scenarios, uh, but we're a bit puzzled because you didn't show that. But after 2050, you have this crazy rebound of a lot of scenarios. Um, so we were not really sure if this is something that we wanted to take as, uh, uh, as data source. Uh, uh, the alternative one was um, uh, the um, this is the last word energy outlook, uh, but where we also see that picture of uh, you know some regions uh, demand goes down for natural gas, but other region demand for natural gas goes up. So it's not that different from what we uh, have in the scenarios that we have so far. And of course, uh, let me end on that. The biggest stranded assets that we have today are the four pipelines from Nord Stream and Nord Stream Two uh, in the Baltic Sea. Um, and that's not climate policy related. So it's really policy uncertainty that's driving the natural gas sector today. Thank you, and sorry for being long. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I guess the analysis is focused on the infrastructure, the, the transportation infrastructure. Just curious about the ramifications for stranded assets on the upstream and the implications that would have on the transportation infrastructure. That in itself might trigger and change the economics of the infrastructure um, itself. Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, we often speak of 
integrated projects, um, uh, really whole value chain, but we didn't look at this at all. Um, uh, and, and uh, I must say that we are not too confident on our results on, on that production capacity side. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I'm going to comment on Olivier's presentation. In fact, it's a clarification. Well, my name is Roberto Schaefer. I'm from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. But I also have another hat. I was one of the two coordinated lead authors of Chapter 3 of the IPCC, which is the one that you make reference here. Mm -hmm. It's not correct to say that 1.5 C scenario with no, no or low overshoot do not see expansion or new investment in fossil fuels. The database does not, does not allow you to say that. Mm -hmm. The granularity of the models do not see field by field. So basically mm -hmm. what we have done is to show in a volume term what's going to be the fate of fossil fuels into the future. But in the same line of Alexandre, you cannot say that you are not shutting down a specific oil field in Canada because of heavy oil and open a new investment or a new oil field in a different region. So you cannot say that. And that's why I also challenge a little bit the result of net zero scenario by the IEA. Because you cannot say that you are not going to invest in new oil fields. You can say that in volume terms, if you s invest in a new oil field, you need to shut down another one. But you can never guarantee, and our result in our models, Alexandre showed that today, you see new investment in oil fields if you have much higher quality oil, much more appropriate for the refining industry that you have today, and eventually shutting down uh, heavy oil from Canada, shutting down oil, heavy oil from Venezuela. So this is my, my comment. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Do you want Should to I go yeah. right away? Yeah. yeah. Do you just to clarify clearly, it is true that from the, the whole set of C1, the 97 scenario from the working group three, we don't find that conclusion, but it is from the subset of uh, a quarter of these, the one that are in line with the um, feasibility threshold for BEX and CCS, fossil CCS development. So with that 26 out of the 100, that's where we find the kind of oil and gas uh, phase out pathway. And uh, it's true that we didn't look at the um, sort of fields themselves, we look at the primary energy that from oil and gas in these uh, in this subset of pathway, and then that's what gives us this the kind of uh, this phase out pathway that is roughly consistent with the, the one from the IEA, IRENA, and uh, several other models that we lo looked at. And uh, if, if I may also just clarify also on the point um, that was made in the last presentation, I mean, the reason why there's a huge rebound in uh, in gas after 2050 is because we only filter with these feasibility uh, threshold with fossil CCS uh, uh, until 2050. So then after 2050, then it's not uh, filtered for fossil CCS anymore. So then there's a huge uptick in, the, um, in fossil carbon sequestration afterwards, which allow for a lot more uh, gas power generation after 2050. But then we may perhaps there should be some other tre threshold built for Hello. Hi, I'm Martin Sokol, Trinity College Dublin, and thanks for a wonderful session. Um, really uh, exciting. Uh, I have a question for Olivier. You mentioned touch upon finance, which I think is absolutely crucial for um, mm. transition to clean energy. And you made an excellent point, which is that uh, it's not the lack of money that's there, which is often used as an excuse for not transitioning to clean energy. But as you said, that the, the money is invested in wrong places, so I continue <laughs> investment in fossil fuels, which is absolutely crucial. So mm, I would like to ask you to expand on this a little bit and maybe tell us if you have any ideas how to achieve shifting that investment to clean energy. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Martí from Martí Horta from the University of Barcelona. And my question is for you regarding the, your presentation on carbon carbon bombs and um, well it looks like you are suggesting us to focus on trying to avoid the extraction of this uh, oil and gas and coal from these carbon bombs from these huge projects instead um, if we consider all the impacts from oil and gas and coal extraction in terms of um, local environmental impacts or health impacts it makes much more sense not to extract all the other oil and, and gas and coal from minor projects, because we would avoid most of the other impacts. So I w wanted to ask you how you, what would you say about this contradiction? Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, are there any questions for, for other speakers so they can be thinking about this? 
Yes, with the gas model, I'm just interested. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Johnny West, um, um, representing Carbon Tracker. With the gas model, um, how do you arrive at the total scenarios of uh, demand in, and, and are you looking at the um, carbon intensity of production in the supply chain at all? Because everything we see around gas shows that the likely overall levels of emissions are higher than the gases bridge fuel argument suggests. Right, so we've got three questions to three speakers. We're thinking of mm -hmm. questions especially for the other speakers, but we'll start with Olivier. Yeah, so th thank you for your question. And um, yeah, so in indeed it's true that it's, like, it's quite mesmerizing how much oil and gas investment are still expected to be um, to be spent in new field and new exploration, which we find are incompatible with meeting the 1.5 degree target. And um, so find it's about a 450 billion investment gap of annual investment in wind and solar alone, while there's about 570 billion that are expected to be invested in um, in new field and new exploration. And uh, I'm not suggesting that this exactly this money that should be reinvested into wind and solar, but um, I think this should be done for remobilizing private capital flows. Uh, that's after we stop subsidizing fossil fuel exploration, obviously. Um, but I think this can be done through um, better corporate net zero uh, methodologies and frameworks and um, establishing more transparency and um, and just accounting for all scopes of emissions of so more comprehensive uh, reporting frameworks, which allows then the financial uh, in financial institutions to then be able to um, channel investments where they, they can find the, the most potential to uh, decarbonize different industries. So having a clear picture on which companies actually have a serious plan for decarbonizing then helps uh, to remobilize capital flows and investment um, investors to uh, put the money where um, they should go. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Olivier. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much, Marty, for pointing to that. Um, I totally agree. There are many, many other reasons beyond climate reasons why we should be stopping fossil fuels. And uh, a couple of years or decades from now, people will be looking back at this historic age and will be shaking their heads and we're saying you're poisoning your water, your air, your food. Um, why 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 did you do that and these local impacts i think they are very real in many places so by no means uh does the carbon bombs analysis mean to say forget about all the rest it's just that uh i came to this work from a, a worry about the climate emergency and um i think the big question there is where are the big pieces that we have to go for if we want to win this uh, uh, fight for climate stability? And that is what we're trying to point to um, at the uh, uh, with this analysis. So um, I do think that it's not to be played off against each other, but rather, you know, get more people uh, into action and also to get them into action on the right things because you know many of us have been tricked by the fossil fuel industry into worrying about our carbon footprints uh, while we're not questioning uh, uh, their business and I think if you have been worrying about your carbon footprint that's okay you know that's also a, a, that's that's also shows that you're thinking about the climate crisis and what what to do about it but I think it's time to start thinking about our carbon handprints and how we are cutting the fuses of these carbon bombs and that's a gigaton that's a billion times more than the tons of uh, carbon footprint you may be producing so um, yes local impacts are definitely uh, something uh, to worry about and a good reason to stop all uh, fossil fuel extraction projects not just the carbon bombs yes. yeah uh, yeah, a very good question how uh, we derived our scenarios. Um, uh, they are based on external sources for the demand, so we don't do any sort of um, um, carbon accounting or um, um, even uh, an evaluation if uh, each of the scenarios uh, is uh, really reaching a two degree Celsius target or not, because it's really just one sector and we don't uh, look at the interaction with other fuels uh, in our um, um, uh, calculations. We want to look at the sectoral implications, if you want. And you have a really good point that there is more than the CO2 emissions. There's, of course, the methane emissions of, uh, of natural gas. And in another extension of the model, we uh, started to look at... Um, <laughs> it's not my cell phone. It's nothing to do with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
mm. we started to look at the effect of uh, some uh, some methane um, sort of taxation policy um, uh, because there is discussion of that in the European Union uh, of some policy framework to address uh, um, climate um, uh, effect of methane and, and the fact that or the uh, the fact that uh, different exporters have different methane intensities, essentially, of their uh, uh, of their natural gas exports to Europe. Um, but what we find so far is that you need really high um, methane prices in terms of CO2 equivalents of really a couple thousand or so uh, euros per ton of uh, CO2 equivalent um, to have an effect on the trade flow, a, a visible effect on the trade flows. Uh, so it's uh, let's say it's a hard one to address with a with a policy. Um, okay. I need your advice. I promised a couple of gentlemen over there a couple of questions. We're a few minutes over already. Can I keep you five minutes for your, your coffee break? Because you're a wonderfully engaged audience. There were two questions at the back there that I didn't take. Thanks, and thanks for the presentations. My name is uh, Elias. I'm working for the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action in Germany. And I wanted to jump on the question that uh, Brandon um, had before uh, to you, Oliver. Um, mm -hmm. Have you looked for the distributional systems of gas in Europe uh, in your analysis? And I guess I can mm. hand over from there two questions, maybe. Yeah, Mr. I, I was going to make a very quick co comment rather than a question, if I may. Of course, sure. It does save time because then they don't have to answer it unless they choose to. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very short. Just um, a, a couple of people have said in the discussion that models like so three of the presentations Kiel, Olivier and, and Steve all talked about new projects and the impact of new projects and a couple of people have said in the discussion well models don't say you can't have new po projects you can have as many as you like as long as you close down some old projects um, and I, I think the same is is pretty much true of any climate mitigation mechanism mm -hmm. models don't say you can't build new coal plants increase your emissions cut your carbon prices and everything as long as you do something else but the the, I think the, the reason that I'm happy to see discussion of, of new projects is because I at least can't see a way of closing down old ones mm. that is economically, legally and, and politically viable. Mm. I would love to hear from, from people the uh, w ways in which they can be closed down so that um, other, other new ones can be opened. But to me, it, it looks like the hardest and least viable path to get there. And so I think what we're talking about here is more viable paths, I hope. Thanks. Um, I think you're going to have the last word, Olivier. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I mean, it's, it's going to be a pretty short answer because we haven't looked at the uh, distributional impact of uh, the gas phase out in, um, within, within Europe. So we just look at the global import number from different sources of, uh, of gas import. So, um, yeah, unfortunately... Uh, I can help you there, but... Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>